Hello. Welcome to Sunday service. How are you doing? I trust that all is well with you and yours. And I'm glad that you are able to join us today for service. To be honest, I struggled with what to share with you today. And I was like, oh Lord, what is the word for the people? I came up with four different sermons. I was like, which one of them, Lord? And not until last night, early hours in the morning, I woke up and I sensed that God wanted me to share something profound with you you know there's i'm studying you know around you know the authenticity of being a christian and i have been studying around that area because we are living in dire times what is that thing that god is looking now for for those that will qualify to be with him forever and ever for those that will qualify to be relevant in the afterlife for those that will hear at the end of the day, thou good and faithful servant. You know, it, it has been a, an interest for me recently. So I'm doing a deep dive in it because I don't want to do all of this and fall short of God's glory. You know, Paul said, not after we've done all these things, we will be a castaway. And I want to speak to you on the global subject I call Jesus's commandment now under this we're going to look at several things i think to appear as if they are different sermons on their own but under this umbrella but we're going to start it off with some questions the teachers of the law the so-called um learned persons you know in his days the sahindrins the pharisees the scribes the rulers, the teachers of the, the rulers of the synagogue, I mean, they could go with all sorts of names. You know, the Pharisees, the Sahindrins came, asked him about a question that had to do with the afterlife. The Pharisees saw how he answered them, so they also came with theirs. And it was recorded in a couple of Gospels, but I'm going to read the one in Matthew. Matthew 22, 34. The Bible says, And when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, Oh, may you silence those that speak against you. May you silence those that accuse you. May you silence those that want to find fault with you and bring you to disrepute. May you silence them. Hallelujah. So he silenced the Sadducees. So they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. So they are constantly testing the last nerves of Jesus. They are constantly trying him. You know, and then he were testing, testing him, asked him a question. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him this question, testing him and saying, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? Like I said, I'll be speaking to you on a global subject I call Jesus' commandment. But first, let's welcome the teacher, the helper, to teach us and guide us. In all truth, sweet spirit, Allos, Paracletus, I welcome you. I ask that you open our hearts. Let God's word be written on the fleshy parts of our hearts. Make us malleable to receive it meekly like little children. Let's desire it and let's imbibe it and let's act and work in line with your word transform us change us in the name of jesus amen and amen and jesus said to them <laughs> hallelujah i always love to read jesus's response but first let's note what the question is in our times we miss the question we miss the pretext and we take the text out of context so that's why I started with the pretext. So what I'm about to read now is actually where I was going to. But if you don't understand the pretext, you will take the text out of content. But before I go back again and read the pretext, let me read Jesus' response to them. So what did Jesus say to them? Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind you shall love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind remember 
At times we teach this and we forget the question. We teach this and we forget the pretext. And if you forget the pretext, and if you don't take the pretext into cognizance, whenever you want to explain what Jesus said, you will explain it well, but you might miss out the meat. Jesus answered the question, what is the greatest commandment in the law? He wasn't answering the question of what is the greatest commandment globally. So there was a scope. That we are looking at that's why he quoted from the law. He now continued his response. I said, This is the first. Hallelujah. Not just the first, he said, This is the greatest commandment. And he gave them a second. He said, The second is love your neighbor as yourself. And I said, Upon these two commandments are the law and prophets prophets hinged on. I think that is interesting. And a place, a certain lawyer in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, also stood up to test him, <laughs> saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, haven't you read what was written in the law? He now says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. I like this account in Luke. Luke quoted it as it is in the Old Testament. You shall love the Lord your God with all your being and dimensions. Hallelujah. And your neighbor as yourself. What is consistent here is loving God. The second that is consistent here is loving your neighbor. How do you love God? With all your being. With your spirit, your mind, and your strength. Your strength there talks about everything that pertains to your physicality and your materialism. Everything that you have that is made of matter, you should use it to love the Lord. How do you love your neighbor? According to the law. He says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So, loving your neighbor should be on the same level that you love yourself. I'm going to come on that later. Maybe not today. But that is the law. That is the law. That is the law. So, there are two clear instructions here. Love God and love people. So, we're going to move to the next phase. How is your love for God seen or felt how does god see that you love him how does god feel and know for sure that you love him and we're going to look at a lot of things and that is what we're going to look at today so the first thing that is so consistent throughout scripture of how god wants to be loved you know at times we love people how we want to be loved and you see that happen in a lot of romantic relationships. You see husbands love their wives the way they want to be loved. And you see wives love their husbands the way they want to be loved. And we miss out on that because you don't love people the way you want to be loved. You love people the way they want to be loved. When you love them the way they want to be loved, they will feel loved by you. A lot of people complain. You see wives say, say to their husbands, you don't love me. You see girlfriends say to their boyfriends, you don't really love me. If you love me, you do this, you do that. And, and you know, and the men usually get confused. But I love you. I say it. I do this. I do that. The yeah, question is, you're loving them the way you want to be loved or the way you think they want to be loved. You've not gone to find out from them how they want to be loved. The only way they will feel loved is if you love them the way they want to be loved. And God has shown us, has said in several places in the Holy Scriptures how He, God, 
wants to be loved. And the very first thing that is so consistent on how God wants to be loved is that you obey him. Obedience. And it amazes me. Just obedience. That is how God feels loved by his children. That is how God feels loved by you. I'm going to go back to the law to say this for sure because God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You see in Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, he says, But showing mercy to thousands, to those that love me and keep my commandments. This is God speaking. He said, He will show mercy to thousands. But who are these thousands? Those that love Him, but they don't only love Him, but they keep His commandments. And you can see there is a clue in that statement that loving God alone is not sufficient for Him. He wants you to keep His commandment. When these two things are in place, God's merciful hand is extended to you. God's grace becomes abundant for you. When you love him the way he wants to be loved. Now let's fast forward to the New Testament. Jesus was speaking to his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 15. He said to them, if you truly love me, he said, keep my commandments. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> if you love God, keep his commandments. He didn't say, if you love me, dance around, worship me, lovey-dovey, <laughs> and do all those lovey-dovey things, and do all those lovey-dovey things around me. He doesn't what he said. He said, just obey my commandments. <laughs> just obedience. Listen to my word, read my word, and obey. That is how I truly know you love me. You can sing a thousand choruses. You can write a thousand poems of how much you love me. If you don't listen to me when I speak, to obey my words, I don't feel it. Hallelujah. John 14 verse 23 and 24 says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. This is Jesus speaking. If you love me, you will keep my word. And when you keep my word, he says, my father will love you. And he will come and make his abode, his home, with you. He who does not love me, he has flipped it. So if you don't love me and does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but it is the father's who sent me. So one way God knows, not you know, but one way that God knows that you don't love him is when you're disobedient. When you clearly see his instructions and you flaunt it. That way you're sending a message to God that you don't love him. And when you don't love God, with that scripture I read for in Exodus 20 at the back of your mind, you will fall short of his mercy. Because he's extending his mercies to those that love him. He's extending his mercies to those that obey him. When you don't love him and keep his word, what do you think happens to his mercy? Hallelujah. Jesus, though he was the son of God, was a clear example of this. He said in that same John 14 verse 31, he says, but that the world may know that I love the father and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Wow! Even Jesus is keen on obeying God's commandment. Whilst in the kind of Gethsemane, you could see that he was so pressured because he knew what he was about to undertake you know, on the cross. He was so pressured. And yet, in that pressure, in that state of depression, in that state of emotional agony, what did Jesus do? The Bible says that he let go of his will and embraced the will of God because he wanted to be obedient to God's command. Isn't that amazing? And we ought to imitate Christ as Christ 
as Christ follows God, we ought to imitate him and be like him. The second way that God feels loved is that we serve him. How much we serve God shows how much we love him. The object of God's love to us is Jesus. Let's listen to Jesus' mission statement. Matthew 20, verse 28. See what Jesus said. He said, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's Jesus' mission statement. He didn't come here to be served. Rather, he came to serve. And how was he going to serve humanity? He was going to serve humanity through his death on the cross. I think that is amazing. It's amazing. We ought to follow Christ. Service is giving your time to help and assist another person. It is not good for man to be alone like what the Bible says. What did God do? God sent a helpmate suitable for him. A help that will assist him and help him be a partner in service so they both can achieve their, their mission and their vision. This is amazing. Another way God feels loved is how much we endure for him. Jesus was talking to his disciples in Mark chapter 10 after he had an encounter with a rich young ruler that he told to go sell his possessions and come and follow him. And Jesus said, oh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom. And the disciples asked him a lot of questions. They said, what of us? What of us? We abandoned the lot to follow you. And Jesus said something profound in Mark 10, 29. So Jesus answered and said to them, assuredly, verily, verily, I say unto you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or land for my sake and for the gospels who shall not receive here on earth a hundredfold. It says now in this time you will receive a hundredfold. All those things you let go, you will get them back here on earth. Glory be to God. And he added with persecutions. <laughs> Hallelujah. In persecutions. And in this age to come, eternal life. Glory be to God. What you endure for him. You know, Jesus said, if you suffer with me, I think it's what rather I said, if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. So how much you endure, you know, when you speak to wives, they have a lot of stories to tell of how much they have endured in the hands of their husbands. And that enduring love is profound it's profound so that is why the bible says that love is patient it's patient it's not easily you know irate or upset it endures all it suffers long that is how god knows that you love him the fourth thing and maybe the final thing i'm going to show you of how god feels loved and i'm going to end today and we'll look at some other ver versions of this global subject next Sunday is this how much we sacrifice to God. How much do we sacrifice? And what I mean by sacrifice, I, I to be honest, I don't like using that word sacrifice loosely. So let me put it this way. God knows and feels rather that you love him or sees your love in motion by how much you give. How much you give what are you giving what are you letting go of there's a popular um, celebrity in Nigeria and he's a Christian he's born again that put a post on social media a couple of months ago I was so grateful to his wife thanking his wife and I think that by then when he put that post they were barely up to two years in marriage and he was so taken by how much his wife has sacrificed for him sacrificed her career sacrificed um, her time everything sacrificed her vision and she said her wife has dedicated her time her life to making sure that his plans his purpose his visions are all met 
So the wife sort of put on hold her life for his own life. I think that's amazing. I think that's amazing. There's a lot of people are saying, oh, why? Why should she do that? Why should you do that? You know, social commentary. Don't li- I hope you don't listen to social commentary. You know, a lot of rubbish and trash. You know, that people put down as a comment, they hide under, you know, they hide, they hide behind the keyboard and spill all sorts of rot on people's posts. So people have said a lot of things. And to be honest, I commend the lady. I mean, that is a show and a sign of true love. Now, if the guy is wise on the flip side, he should also know that it gets to a point too. He must also allow the woman give up a lot of stuff. In fact, he should even give up more than the wife gave up because in a marriage, the man plays the role of a husband. And like Jesus gave up a lot, who is our groom, he should also give up a lot to ensure that the wife also achieves her purpose, her dreams, her visions. And that same, that way, the symbiotic, you know, relationship will be so fruitful and enjoyable by both parties so i commend her i commend their relationship and big ups to them when god tested abraham and asked abraham to go and sacrifice isaac it was a test of faith yes but it was a test of love it was a test of where the heart of abraham as regards worship and what he holds there to is god wanted to test Abraham's love for him. God wanted to test Abraham's faith in him because love and faith and hope all work together. There are three things, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest is love. So that was a test. What can you give to God? Can you give your all if he asks for it? Do you know and realize that everything you have comes from him? That everything you are was as a consequence of what he gave you, as a consequence of his grace. If he demands it, if he makes a request for it, can you give it up willingly? It shows how much you love God. Jesus so loved the world that he sacrificed everything for our salvation. Now when we look at this portion of portion of giving. What, how can we give? How should we give in the New Testament to express our love for God? And I have several things put down. I might mention them and we'll continue from here next week. We're in the New Testament. And I always say this first, and this is the first thing I'm going to say. Any teaching you hear that tries and you know to stop you from giving to God you should look at that teaching again. One of the easiest way to test if that teaching on giving is from God is if it tries to stop you or limit your giving to God. You know, anything that does that is not from God. God will not stop you from giving to him. However, for him to receive your giving, there are conditions that you must meet for your giving to be acceptable to God. And this is important. So we're going to look at a lot of conditions that makes your giving acceptable. I repeat, anyone, anything that stops you from giving to God, that tries to limit your giving to God, is not from God. God will never, ever sponsor that. Never, ever sponsor that. But He wants you to give but give in a certain way. Hallelujah. So the next thing I'm going to tell you is that in the New Testament, when it comes to giving to God, one thing is paramount. You will notice that there are not so much laws surrounding giving in the New Testament as it was in the law. Why is that so? One of the reasons for the law is that man did not have the capacity to govern themselves the way God wants man to be governed. I'll say that again. One of the reasons for the law is that man lacked the ability to govern themselves the way God wants them to be governed 
or in a way that is acceptable to God. So because of that, God gave the law, do this, do that, this, that, 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 that. But it is not so in the New Testament. The Bible says something, the prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, prophesied this in the old. They kept on saying there's a day that is coming that men will not need another man to say, do this, do that, do that, do that, da, 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 da. He says, why? He says, in the day we are living in, which is the New Testament, you will not need anyone to tell you what to do because my laws will be written in your heart. What is he trying to say? He said that you will know what to do from your spirit. That means you will be eternally governed to live right or to live in such a way that is acceptable by me. And how did he do that? He sent us the helper. And Jesus wrote about this in John 14, 15, 16, and 17. He introduced the helper. He says, this helper will guide you in all truth. So this helper will take that which is mine and communicate it to you. What is his? His words. That is the laws of God. The laws of God are the words of Christ. But this time around, it will be your heart. He says that as many that allow the spirit in their heart to rule them, to lead them, say those ones are now the sons of God. This is what God is talking about. So as the spirit leads you and you obey the spirit that is in your spirit leading you in accordance with the laws of God, in accordance with the Bible, with the words of Christ, he said, you are now acceptable as my sons and daughters. So when it comes to giving in the New Testament, there are no laws, so to say. The number one law is guidance by the Spirit. And I'm going to go back to the first thing I pointed out. The Holy Spirit will never, ever stop you from giving to God. Never. Never. So that's why if you listen to me talk about giving, you will always hear me say one thing. One thing is consistent in all my messages on giving. <laughs> I always say, be led by the Spirit when you want to give. That means you have to constantly inquire Query the spirit on what to give, on how to give, and when to give. Listen to me, and this is my experience. When you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, you will give more than you would have given by obeying the law. And what is the law? Give 10% tithe. Give percent tithe. I'm not against tithe. I pay my tithe myself. So I can't pay my tithe and be against it. It's not possible. But see what I'm saying. Listen to me carefully. When you pay your tithe, there are some conditions you must fulfill in the New Testament. Don't pay your tithe out of compulsion. Don't pay your tithe out of fear. Don't pay your tithe out of um, duress. And this is one of the conditions that you must meet whenever you're giving in the New Testament. There are many of them. I'm sensing I should just slow down. So I'll just stop very soon. I'm going to continue next Sunday. But let me just finish my thoughts on this. You don't give on that duress. You don't let anybody compel you. You have to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. When you listen to the Holy Spirit, when it comes to giving, from my own experience and from for the few people I know that do this, they will always tell you that they give more than 10%. One said that he that he gives 25%. That the last year, since he started obeying this instruction, he discovered that he gave 25% of his income. And said, you know what? That has been paying his tithe for donkey years. God has been blessing him here. But he said, I've never experienced the kind of blessing that he got in this last one year than all the years he has been paying his tithe. What did he change? He changed listening to the Spirit when it comes to giving. 
So he pays his tithe and he gives whenever the spirit prompts him to give. That is the law of giving in the New Testament. It is given as you are led by the Spirit. If only we can obey it. The problem is that obedience. That's why one of the things I showed you, or one of the ways that God knows that you love Him, is by obeying. That's where the challenge is. The Holy Spirit is always leading us to give. I'm telling you. He's always leading us to give. The question is, are we responding to that leading? Are we obeying that leading? At times it is fear that stops us from obeying that leading. Fear of the unknown. Okay, if I give this, then what will happen to me tomorrow? How will I eat? How will I pay my students? It's the fear of the unknown that usually stops us from obeying the leading of the Spirit. Years ago, I think it's about eight, nine years ago, the Holy Spirit showed me something profound. There was a time there was a need in church and we had to give. And I noticed at that moment, what I wanted to give, I didn't have it. And the Holy Spirit whispered into my ears. He said, see, see, that amount you don't have now, you should have had it. I'm like, how do you mean? He said, if you have been listening to me in the past, directing you on what to give, how to give, if you had obeyed me, you would have had the supply to give this big amount today and that changed my life i was like what he said yes that your ins insufficiency now is because you disobeyed you did not obey listen to me the key to financial progress success in the new testament is listening to the holy spirit when it comes to giving <laughs> and when you do write it down somewhere you will far and give your 10 percent what am i saying just restricting your giving to 10 percent is actually limiting you oh you didn't hear me restricting your giving to just 10 percent is a limitation but don't, don't go off now i start okay i'm going to give 20 percent. i'm going to give 30 percent. no 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 don't also do that don't be compelled by my teaching to do that. Revert to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> if you didn't hear me today, hear this. Revert to the Holy Spirit when it comes to giving to God. Listen. He's always speaking. And obey. What I want you to do today is to commit. Is to pledge. To obey whenever the Spirit compels you to give. I'm going to show you a lot of things when it comes to this. How does God know and feel that you love him? It's through your giving. I'm going to show you a lot of things about giving to God. As instructed in the New Testament. So we'll stop living as if we are under the law. So we'll stop living as if we are in the Old Testament. We are in the new. The old has been taken away. Doesn't mean it has been cancelled. Don't get me wrong. But it has been taken away. It's really the rituals. But the essence of the rituals are still with us. Because Jesus, God, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Give us never lack. Give us never go down. Give us will always be on top. Giving to God pays. You can never outgive God. Some of the things you are hoping to change might just require serious giving serious giving and one of the laws of giving which i'm going to speak to you next week is you give what you have why one of the laws of giving the new testament you don't give what you don't have you give what you have because in the new testament god is against borrowing to give god does not want you to owe god does not want you to be in debt so i've heard a lot of churches ministers compel their members to go and borrow so they can give it is not scriptural it is from the pit of hell in the new testament one of the laws of giving is to give what you have hallelujah so when then does vow comes come into giving yes you can vow you vow what you have pastor how do you mean a good example is okay i'm paid the salary of five thousand pounds every month I don't have this money to give today, but I can make a vow based on next month's salary. So you're making a vow on what you have. 
You're not making a vow on what you don't have. You're not going to go and borrow to give. Don't do that. God will not accept it. The church will, but God won't because it's against his law. God will not accept what he has told you not to do. I don't know if you get it. God says, don't do this. He said, no, my pastor said I should do it. So I'm going to do it. And you're not expecting God to bless you. No, your pastor will bless you, but God won't. Hallelujah. Okay, meet me on Sunday. Glory be to God. I don't know if you've been blessed. If you have been blessed, please leave a comment. I want to read from you. What is that thing that you heard today that will change your life? What is that thing that you heard today that you implement? What is that thing that, will get, that you heard today that you're going to ask God to forgive you? <laughs> yes. Because if you hear God's word and it doesn't reprimand you, caution you to change, then I doubt if it's God's word. I want to read from you. So leave that comment and I'll read from you. I'm going to pray this prayer for everyone that wants to make a change when it comes to showing their love to God. I'm going to ask the Lord, the Lord to show you mercy upon mercy. Father, show them mercy upon mercy. Father, show them grace upon grace. Father, let grace be multiplied to them in the name of Jesus. And I pray for those giving an offering today, paying their tithe in accordance to the leading of the Holy Spirit. I ask that you increase them, that you bless them, that doors will be opened up to them, that heaven rain blessings on them, that they're going out and they're coming in be blessed that whatever they put their hands to do will be blessed that their children will be blessed and be mighty on the earth that their businesses will grow and expand that their academics will be the best ever that we experience father make them a praise on this earth in the name of jesus and i command that pain in your body to leave now out in the name of jesus you ought not to torment the daughters and the sons of god be gone Arise from that bed right now. You are healed in the name of Jesus. So go succeed, go prosper, for God is with you. I'm going to see you on Tuesday. We are continuing our expose on Ephesians. It's getting hot. Bye-bye.